I'll basically be taking you guys through biotech and primary tissue types today. So, um, yeah, this is, like I kind of said a little bit to the people who were here previously, it's relatively high yield, um, especially your primary tissue type, so your epithelium, um, muscle, and also bone stuff. But yeah, let's get started. So biotechnology, the way it was taught for us, it was split up into three. So first, um, I was talking a bit about your recombinant DNA, and then we had stuff about therapeutic cloning and also your gene therapy and editing. So that's all your CRISPR-Cas9 stuff. You guys will be getting a shoot on it sometime this week, I'm quite sure. Um, so hopefully if all of this makes sense, you'll at least have something to refer back to if you do get confused. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So recombinant DNA, what exactly is it? It's DNA that has been formed um, using multiple different kinds of sources. Um, Okay, that's all fine. So different kinds of sources. So what you essentially do, we get a particular gene that we are interested in. And after that, we can extract that gene using these things called restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes, think about it as like your molecular scissors. So it cuts the gene where we want it. And then the way we cut it, we have to cut it with sticky ends on the side. So think about it in terms of Legos, right? If you have two pieces of Legos and just put them right next to each other, they're not gonna stay in place and then they're going to move around. So if you do put Legos that are overlapping each other, they're going to stick better and there's going to be a less, um, it's going to be less likely to like break apart. Um, so after that, we basically put the gene that we wanted into a thing called a vector. And then afterwards we use DNA ligase to basically seal everything together. So there's a couple of characteristics to do with this vector. So first of all, it has to have a replication unit. There's no point in you having the gene in your vector if it's not going to continue replicating. So then you get whatever you want. So that's the first thing. Second thing, we need to have something called recognition sequences. So we know whereabouts your um, kind of DNA or whereabouts your gene should be inserted into this vector. And third of all, we need something called reporter genes. So this lets us know whether or not our gene is actually in the vector or not. So one thing that usually is used is your antibiotic resistance. So if you have that gene also encoded in your vector, you'll end up with... Um, a kind of, yeah, a bact not a bacteria, you'll end up with something that has antibiotic resistance. So if you put it into an agar plate filled with bacteria, you'll be able to see that it's actually working. Um, so this is basically a whole entire diagram showcasing all of this. Um, I'll talk about the last bit in just a sec. So if we think about it, we get a particular gene that we want. So that's the purple bit. And then that bit has already been cut out using your, um, what was it, sorry, your restriction enzymes. And then afterwards we insert it into our vector. And then afterwards we insert this vector into a host cell. So this process is called transformation, which is outlined here. What you do is you insert it in and then afterwards, because it's in the host, it can produce your protein and then continue replicating. And your recombinant DNA, the point of it is to kind of produce this protein. And then humans, we can use this protein um, for whatever purpose that we need it to be. Um, and that's basically the whole process. So usually um, this whole entire process, it happens in bacteria or yeast cells, mostly just because it's easier to grow. Um, however, in some situations, your protein needs to be modified after it's been produced. So think stuff that happens in your endoplasmic reticulum. And in that case, all of this has to happen in your mammalian or your yeast cells. So that's basically when you use those instead. And then in the last situation, um, Basically, if you're producing larger proteins, you need more mechanisms. So therefore, mammalian cells are typically used in those cases as well. Um, an example of all of this happening is what happens in farming. So I don't know if you've talked about this or not, but essentially you get the vector you're interested in, put it into your vector, and then put that vector into um, a particular cell. In this case, they put it into an animal egg and then implant that egg into the mother. So then after you have that particular gene that you're interested in, um, yeah, the sheep can basically produce more milk and then that protein will be found in that milk. So in this case, it was the human alpha-1 antitrypsin. And because the milk's really easily harvested, you can take that protein and then, yeah, it's going to be relatively easy for that. Um, so that's more just an example of recombinant DNA being used in real time and place, I guess. There's other two more examples that were covered in your lectures. So the first is tissue plasminogen activator. Second is your enzyme therapy. So for your tissue plasminogen activator, um, it's basically used to dissolve, or like it's used in patients who have a high likelihood of suffering from like heart attacks and strokes. So what happens normally in your blood, you've got something called fibrin. 
and that helps produce blood clots. So obviously we need blood clots. Otherwise, if you like fall, scrape your knee, you're going to be bleeding incessantly and that's not going to be good. So that's what fibrin is used for. However, there's some situations where you might have too much fibrin and you're forming too many blood clots, which can be dangerous because if you're forming blood clots, especially in your like blood vessels, that can put you at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So, which is why we've got something called plasminogen. So what that does is it's converted into something called plasmin, which disrupts this pathway and that causes um, your blood clots to either, oh no, that basically stops the formation of your blood clots, sorry. Um, and your tissue plasminogen activator is basically the enzyme that helps um, your plasminogen be converted into plasmin. So what happens now is the TPA, we get the gene that codes for it and put it into E. coli through the whole entire recombinant DNA pathway. It can end up forming a lot of plasmin and then we give that plasmin to, um, oh no, sorry. No, no, yeah, so we give that TPA to individuals who don't have enough of that, that causes them to produce plasma and therefore um, hopefully help with situations where they have a high risk of heart attacks and strokes. Um, second situation is your enzyme replacement therapy. Um, this is with um, mostly people who suffer from hypopituitary dwarfism, which means that they basically, they're very short because they're missing that particular um, protein. And in the past, it used to be derived from cadavers and then there was a massive disease outbreak in the 1980s, which caused them to lose their massive supply of cadavers and they couldn't use it. So um, they decided to use recombinant DNA therapy, therefore being able to get um, your HGH, which is like that particular hormone, um, and give it to people with that particular, what's it called? Um, pathology. There we go. Um, okay. So what is the polymerase chain reaction? That's Okay, it's a process that is used to produce a lot of DNA extremely quickly. Um, what this process involves, um, it basically doubles the amount of DNA you have every single cycle. So if you start off with one strand of DNA, next time you're going to have two, then you have four, eight, etc. And it's done through three steps. So the first step, if we have a look through this diagram, so first step, we have two strands of well, one two strands of DNA, there we go. So first thing we do, we denature it, so apply a lot of heat to it. This causes your DNA strands to separate. After it separates, we anneal it, so we chuck in a primer at the three prime end. And then if you think about normal DNA synthesis, what happens is then your DNA polymerase is going to come along and then synthesize the rest of that strand. And then that's one whole entire process done. And then the whole entire thing repeats again. So then you denature it, causing it to split, Afterwards, then you put on your primers. After that, um, DNA polymerase comes along again and process repeats. So everything's basically written there. If you want a better explanation, um, this is a pretty good site that I found. So you can check that out if that still didn't make sense. But basically just think three steps. You separate, chuck on your primers, and then synthesize more is basically your PCR. Okay, so stem cells. Um, a few of you guys, you either would have covered this in biology or the biobridging course, because I think they did a massive, like, okay, maybe it changes over the years, but for our year, they did a whole entire research project on this. But anyway, so stem cells, it's undifferentiated cells, and they can produce anything. Oh, okay. Well, depending on the kind of cell, they can produce infinitely more cells. So think like, I don't know, a queen bee. Do queen bees actually like produce bees. I don't know. Um, but basically stem cells, they can produce infinitely amounts of different cells. Um, and they can be put into three different categories. So we've got totipotent cells that basically gives rise to any kind of cell in the body. And then you've got your pluripotent ones, which, whoops, yeah, they can give rise to all the cells in your body, except for the ones in your placenta. And then multipotent, they can develop um, into certain types of cells, but they can make an infinite amount of those cells. So it's summarized into this diagram here. So totipotent at the top, they can produce your pluripotent cells, and then those can produce your multipotent cells. Did I just get something in the chat? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, I should probably go through a few questions. Um, is the reported gene the same as a selectable marker? Mm, in there, yes it is. And is it important to memorize these specific examples? Um, so examples of, whoops, whereabouts are we? Um, these, I'd say it's not particularly, you won't be tested on it per se, but these are more just like ways for you to understand how everything works and put everything together, I guess. 
and it's placenta that only extra embryonic cell. Extra embryonic cell. Yeah, um, actually. Mm, I don't think it's necessarily, or oh, actually I might have to Google that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, let me just copy that question. We will get back to you on that. I'll have a look around. And um, if you guys have been following up with stuff that's been happening on the Curious Cat, I'll put that question in there and then give you an answer then because I'm not 100% sure of that at the moment. Um, yep, yeah, sorry about that. So, yep, yeah, those are kind of like your three different types of stem cells. Um, yep, yeah. okay, so embryonic stem cells and somatic cell nucleos, nuclear transfer, they're kind of two separate things, but I put them together in one um, and you'll kind of see why in a sec. So what exactly are embryonic stem cells? It's quite literally what the name suggests. They're stem cells, but they're derived from an embryo. And that's one good thing about that because they're derived from your embryo. Those cells are more, oh, sorry, pluripotent, meaning they can differentiate into any kind of cell in the body. By the way, um, clarification for definition, differentiate just means um, form specialized cells. Yeah, so somatic nu cell nuclear transfer, it basically involves taking a nucleus from one cell and putting it into another. So kind of example is shown here. So let's say we've got two cells. We've got cell A and we've got cell B. So cell A, it contains DNA that we want. So then what happens is you extract the nucleus from cell A because nucleus contains your DNA. And then we hold that. And then from cell B, we get rid of the nucleus from there. And then we take the nucleus from cell A, put it into cell B, and then basically allow it to replicate. So then you have a whole bunch of embryonic cells. And after that, you can take your embryonic stem cells and then produce whatever kind of cell that you want. Obviously, there's a few pros and cons relating to that. So um, good points. You can potentially treat any kind of disease in your body because stem cells, they can produce any kind of cell. So um, if it's a neuron problem, um, you can produce more neurons. If it's more like muscular, produce more muscle cells. And also, because all of these stem cells, they ultimately belong to you. So that gets rid of any risk of immunological rejection as well. And as a result, you don't have to wait for like organ transplants because theoretically you could be producing or like making those organs yourself. Um, yeah. And as for disadvantages, it's a whole entire like ethical worm can, I guess, because are we supposed to, or like there's ethical debate as to whether or not you should be destroying these human embryos. And also should you be creating these embryos for the purpose of just taking the cells out. So yeah, there's a lot of discussion around that as well, um, which is a good thing that we have induced pluripotent stem cells. So what are they? They are basically adult stem cells, but then we reprogram it to become pluripotent. Um, how that usually happens, in order for your pluripotent cell to become your adult stem cell, a bunch of genes, they're switched on or off, and then that causes that formation or like that change. So in order for it to become pluripotent stem to become a pluripotent stem cell from your adult cell you just basically change those four genes again and then that allows it to revert back to its pluripotent form so if you have a look at this diagram here we've got adult fibroblast cells here we reprogram it back into your induced pluripotent stem cells and then once we have it in that form you can basically form whatever kind of um, specialized cell that you want same situation as before there's a few issues because we're dealing with um, gene modification, there are some risks. So one thing that they found is that induced pluripotent stem cells, you've got extra cancer-causing genes and you're turning off your tumor suppressor genes as well. So that's going to cause issues down the road, especially if you have those cells in you. And also with the tips and centers of our chromosomes not resetting to the embryo-like state, um, if you think what's on top of your chromosome, so you've got like your telomeres and stuff, if those aren't reset, you're going to have like shorter telomeres and then that's going to cause um, like your cells to kind of like die and that's not going to be good as well. So it might be like a different age to your other kind of cells, if that kind of makes sense. Um, yep. Okay, sweet. And this is also an example or like a summary diagram, I guess. So you've got your embryonic stem cells basically taken from your embryo and you have a, bit, a bunch of them and then they can differentiate versus your induced pluripotent stem cells, which start off as your adult stem cells. You reprogram them, they become more pluripotent and then they can specialize. So that's that. Um, 
Okay, so I've just got another question uh, to re-explain um, the telomeres point. Yeah, that was poorly explained. Um, sorry. So think about it like this. If you've got, so telomeres, the point of them is that, oh, this is brushing up on bio again. If you have telomeres on the end, right, it prevents your, it prevents like DNA replication and stuff from going wrong. Because what happens is if you do have, uh, if you don't have your telomeres, stuff isn't going to like, uh, when you're repl replicating your DNA and it goes all the way to the end, um, you're going to miss out on certain bits of important DNA. So if you're normally in a child, the telomeres are going to be long. And as you like grow older, they're going to get shorter and shorter. Um, so in the case where your telomeres haven't reverted back to its embryo-like state, you're going to have short telomeres, which is going to increase the pos well, not possibility. It's going to increase the amount of the error rate and as a result that's going to cause more problems if that kind of makes sense that was also a crappy explanation um yeah let me know if you want me to re explain that again um but in the interest of time i might move on so one last bit um uh, relating to your biotechnology is going to be a gene therapy so what gene therapy does is it um introduces new genes to get rid of any kind of disease that you might have. So a couple years in the past, um, or even like as of current, they can only do gene addition, meaning if you're missing a gene, I'll get this gene, I'll give it to you via like inserting it into viral DNA and then basically infecting you with the virus. And then you've got the gene, everything's good. Except now there's been new advances in technology. So we can do something called gene editing rather than just gene addition. And you might've heard of something called CRISPR-Cas9, but this is where all of this comes into play. And you will have um, a tutor on this, and this is relatively important. So I'll try and explain this in an easier term, I guess. So what happens is breaking it up into two parts, CRISPR refers to your RNA, Cas9 refers to your protein. So this is something that normally happens in bacteria anyway. So when a bacteria is infected with a virus, the virus is going to insert its DNA into the bacteria cell, right? And then this, so once that happens, so your bacteria is like, oh no, I've been attacked, what do I do? It synthesizes two RNA. So first RNA is your, um, it's called CRISPR RNA, so CRRNA. And then your second one is your tracer RNA. So these two eventually come together to form something called your guide RNA. And that's just basically your combination. So what's special about them? So your CRNA, oh sorry, your CRISPR, your CRISPR RNA, sorry. Um, that contains something called a spacer, which you can see as like these little colored blocks. What that is, is it's something that is, will perfectly match with your, a section of your viral DNA. So if you have a look in this image, I um, don't know if you can see it, but basically the blue section, that's going to be your CRISPR RNA. And then the brown section, that's going to be your tracer RNA. And those two together form your guide RNA. And then this particular light blue thing here, that's your target sequence. That's the thing that's going to be present on your viral DNA. So your CRISPR RNA is going to match up perfectly with that viral DNA. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, after that, what happens is your guide RNA, it's going to combine with your Cas9 protein and those two together are going to form your CRISPR-Cas9 complex. And afterwards, you're going to have your viral DNA. It's going to feed through this whole entire complex. So the green thing is your Cas9 protein, by the way. So it's going to feed through. And when that target sequence on your viral DNA matches perfectly with whatever's on the guide RNA, you've got something called um, your nucleases. So your Cas9 nuclease, sorry. These are your molecular scissors, and they're going to cut it at that point. And what happens if you're cutting it, then your viral DNA is going to be um, disrupted and inactivated. So one way that we can use this is we can synthesize the guide RNA in labs so that they are going to target specific genes. And once that happens, we can basically give those, um, basically insert the guide RNA into the human via like viral genomes um, and cause um, your CAS system to cut your DNA at certain bits. So let's say if you have a gene for like cystic fibrosis or something, um, and you want to get rid of it, we can theoretically insert it in and then cut out that gene at that specific place. And um, taking this a step further, scientists nowadays, they can also give you um, additional genes to 
kind of put in place of your original genes. So that's where the whole entire gene addition thing comes in, where after they've taken out the gene that they don't want, they also inject in um, a different kind of gene that is there in a healthy person. And then theoretically, you'd have a normal healthy gene and therefore like be healthy and be cured. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what your CRISPR-Cas9 thing is. If you want an explanation of that, once again, these are two really good links on YouTube. Um, because I think CRISPR-Cas9, it's something that's not taught too well. And if you can make sense of it, it does like help a lot. Um, and one last thing to do with your biotech. So gel electrophoresis, not really high yield. So you kind of just like know this. Think of this like, it's very similar to what you learn in chem. You've got a bunch of DNA. You put them into like little, what are these called? Like little slices or something. And then you run um, an electric current through it, causing all of the... DNA to be pulled because your DNA is negative and then the current's positive. Oh, sorry, no, the current pulls your negative DNA towards the positive end. Yeah, and that will serve to separate um, DNA into different kind of bands depending on how big and how small they are. Um, I did a little, oh, what was it called? Um, yeah, so think about it. It's, oh, I just remember the name of it. Um, but it's like that thing in chem where you, you basically like get a particular mixture and you pour it through. Oh, whoops, sorry, that's my bad. Um, you basically pour it through that massive tube and then it comes out in like different times depending on how big the thing is. I've forgotten the name, but there is something for it. Um, anyway, so that's like the end of biotechnology. Any other kind of questions relating to that? If not, we might move on. It's like 10.55. Um, Okay, if you guys do have any questions, um, we can like continue and go back to that. Anyway, so your primary tissue types. So we'll break this down into three primary tissue types. There are technically four. The fourth one's like neurons, but neurons will be covered a bit later on once you guys learn about synaptic transmission. So first of all, you've got your epithelium tissue. So what is epithelium tissue? It's all of the cells or like tissues that line the surface of the body. So you've got epithelium tissue, so skin, think, um, also GI tract, so when you're eating stuff, it's exposed to the external environment, so it's going to be lined with epithelial tissue. And other ones, so CVS is just cardiovascular system and urinary tract as well. Um, a few characteristics, it's going to be avascular. So if you think like your skin, if you, uh, I'm not gonna say, if you like scrape yourself and you only scrape like the top layer, you're not going to have any blood come out of it. Um, so that's one characteristic. Second is it regenerates quickly. So I think you want your skin to be regenerating very quickly. Um, very little space between cells. We'll talk a bit about that in structure in a sec um, as for the rest of these. And then you've got your different functions. So first of all, for protection, you've got your skin on the outside surface of your body to prevent things from um, bacteria and exotoxins. Oh no, so prevent bacteria from like harming your body. Absorption, um, it's required in your small intestine and also your kidney to absorb nutrients. Secretion, likewise, um, secreting different kinds of hormones and also mucus. So that's also going to be done by epithelium tissue. Transport, things in your kidneys and sensory perception, um, epidermis, which is just like your skin as well. Um, whoops. Yeah, so structure of epithelium cells, we can split it up into three. So whatever's on the surface, whatever's on the side and whatever's on the bottom. So starting off from the top, you can have microvilli. What that does is it increases your surface area. And because of that, it will most often be found in your small intestines because think your food, nutrients, it's going to be absorbed mostly in your small intestines. So that's where it's going to be found. Um, cilia, what that does, it's to facilitate movement and it's mostly like, um, like a sweeping motion as it's usually described. So because it's sweeping out stuff, going to be found in your respiratory tract and also overduct. So respiratory tract, if you've got bacteria um, or different kind of pathogens um, in the air that we breathe in, so your respiratory tract, the epithelium cells, they're going to sweep all of that out alongside like your mucus as well. Overduct, I think it's like it helps propel like the sperm or something. Um, cilia, you guys would have touched on this very briefly. It's got like a nine plus two structure. So two central microtubules, nine pairs. You don't really have to know that in depth. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what's at the surface, what's on the bottom, it's something called your basal lamina. All that does is it makes sure that your cell doesn't fall off. So it basically just holds it there um, via something called a hemidesmosome. It's like that little red thing here. 
Um, also keep in mind, your cell should be always sitting on top of your basal lamina. It should never cross it. Only situation where it does cross it is if it's a cancer cell. Reasoning behind that is underneath your basal lamina, it's going to be a lot of blood and like your vascular supply. And because cancer cells, they want to grow, right? So that's why they grow through the basal lamina and get access to that vascular supply. So then they end up spreading around the body. Um, but normal cells, they shouldn't be crossing the basal lamina. Okay, so we've talked about the top, the bottom, now for the side. So on the side, you've got four main things. So on the top, something called tight junctions. So they're very tight they're at the top. They prevent things from going in between cells. So by the way, just like for orientation, this is one cell, this is another cell, that's another one. And this is just like the in-between. Um, yep, so it's like a watertight seal. Um, then we've got this called your zanular adherence and also your desmosomes, um, labeled number three. The only difference between these two is just like, what they use. So both of them, they help um, your cells like stick together, I guess. So for your zanular adherence, they use actin filaments. Your desmosomes, they use intermediate filaments. That's pretty much the only difference. Your gap junctions, um, they are the things that facilitate flow between your epithelium cells. So this could be for water, this could be for electrolytes um, and allow things to like go in and out between different epithelium cells. Okay, so now we kind of talked a bit about the structure. So what are the different types? So the types, they can be split up into, um, depending on two characteristics. First, the number of cell layers, and second, the shape of your cell. So it's relatively straightforward. If you've got one layer, it's going to be simple. If there's multiple layers, it's going to be stratified. So that's that. And as for shape, also kind of straightforward. Squamous, think squished, so therefore flat. Cuboidal, like a cube, columnar in a column shape. So that's pretty much all of that. Um, there's a few additional classifications. So keratinized just means containing keratin. Transitional, um, this is pretty interesting. So it's basically when your tissues or cells, they can cha um, change shape depending on whether or not your organ is stretched or not. So if you think in your bladder, if you're really busting to pee, um, your cells, which usually are your simple cuboidal ones, they become squamous. So think cube and now it's squished. So now you've got more room, I guess, for the fluid to accumulate. And then when you do um, end up going to the bathroom and then getting rid of all that fluid, it's going to like go back to your cuboidal shape. Um, pseudo stratified, all that means is it's one layer of cells, but it looks stratified. Main difference, how do you know it's pseudo stratified? If you look at the placement of the nuclei, unlike all the rest where it's kind of all in the same line of field, I guess, um, pseudo stratified, they're kind of like up, down, left, right. So it makes it look like they're stratified, but they're actually just one. Um, it's typically just the case for columnar cells. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but that's just the case, I guess. So better question is, how do I know what's what? So one thing to keep in mind, the shape of your epithelium cell will correlate with what its function is. Um, awesome. Okay. So yeah, the shape of your epithelium cell will correlate with its function. So if you've got squamous cells, think it's very thin. So a lot of absorption is going to be occurring in those. So you'll find them in the lungs, also in your blood vessels. Um, if you also think of, oh, okay, we'll talk about them in a sec. And then cuboidal and columnar, they're larger. So they can be used to produce mucus and other hormones. So they're going to be found in the GRT. Um, another way to think about it is the larger your cell is, the more complicated things can be in there. So if you need to do a lot of complicated things, you're likely to have larger cells. So stuff in your um, GI tract that are necessarily, let's say for um, excretion and also for absorption, you're going to need more things for those mechanisms. So you're likely to find like columnar and cuboidal cells in your GIT versus on your skin. You don't really need to like, I don't know, absorb nutrients through your skin. So you're going to have squamous cells there. Um, another note, so cells, they take a lot of time and energy to make. And therefore, places where there's um, like high cell turnover, you want to be using those squamous cells because they take less energy to make. So think your skin, your mouth, um, because you're likely to like scrape something or like eat something that's too hot that might potentially burn you, you're more likely to find squamous cells there because they're more disposable. Um, yep, also another link on the bottom, Crash Course explains this very well as well. Um, awesome, so talking a bit about glands. So glands, the main job is to excrete stuff. They can be separated into two, your exocrine and your endocrine. Only difference, exocrine secretes stuff into a duct, endocrine secretes it into your blood slash tissue. 
Um, so this is an example of the exochrome one. All of these lining here, these are all going to be your epithelium cells. So as I said, epithelial cells, they can excrete stuff as well. So you're going to be excreting stuff and then that's all going to go into your duct, which then goes to the rest of your body. So this could be something, let's say, in your gastrointestinal tract. This will also be like secreting oils and like sweat um, versus endocrine, more to do with your hormones. So because it's going straight into your bloodstream, it's not going to be like secreting sweat into your bloodstream. That would not be good. Um, and this is just a histology picture of um, an exocrine glands in the bowel. If you can have a look at all of the white things, these are called goblet cells. And the main purpose of that is to secrete mucus. And if you think, where is mucus needed? Well, it's kind of needed in your bowel. So that's one way they can potentially think, oh, where could this be? Um, yeah, and a bit about skin. It, this will be covered again in second sem as well. So if you don't fully understand it, like don't worry too much about it. But just very quickly, so top layer, epidermis. Dermis is like all the red thing over here. Melanocytes, they produce melanin. Sweat glands, they produce sweat. Sebaceous glands, they produce like oil. And myoepithelium cells, think myo means muscle. We'll get into that in just a bit as well. Um, so they're part of your sweat glands. And because they're do, to do with muscle, they basically squeeze it. And then that causes your sweat to come out. Um, Mysis corpuscle, um, it's something like near, it's like a receptor that's near the top of the skin. And it senses your like fine touch. And persinium corpuscle, it's more deep below, so it senses your deep pressure and vibration. Um, yeah, don't stress too much about that. You will learn a lot about that in SEM2, but that's just like a little bit of a data, I guess. Okay, so here's a question. What kind of epithelium is this? Um, might be throwing you guys in the deep end, but yeah, between simple columna, pseudostratified columna, simple cuboidal or stratified cuboidal. B. Um, yes, perfect. And additional question, can you take a guess where this tissue is located? Don't worry about getting this wrong, guys. Like, oh, yep. Oh, okay, getting a few more. Yeah, so really good guess. Um, yeah, you guys are mostly correct. Oh, wait, is it also because I've got the answers on the bottom? Oh, well. Um, well, for those of you who didn't look at the answers, um, yes, you are correct. Respiratory tract or trachea. And one good way you can kind of tell is because you have all of the cilia on the top. And if you think whereabouts is cilia required, it's going to be required where you're producing mucus. So, yep, um, respiratory tract is a good idea. GIT, um, if you think about it, GIT, it's more to do with your... Um, oh, yeah, all good. So your GIT, you don't really need to, like, propel your food in a certain direction. So you'll learn more about this in second year, but it's more caused by your peristalsis. So like your muscles kind of contracting, um, which is why we don't really require cilia. And another thing that you can notice in here, so the goblet cells that I was talking about before, all of the white bits, these are also present here. So those are going to be producing mucus, which also kind of lets us know, oh yeah, this could be potentially in the respiratory tract. But yeah, awesome job guys. Um, yeah, so moving on to muscle. Um, very big picture to small picture stuff. So we start off with a skeletal muscle bundle and that contains a lot of muscle fibers. So one muscle fiber can also be called a fascicle. After that, one single fascicle contains a lot of myofibrils and myofibrils are like this thing. And inside your myofibril, you have lots of small sarcomere units all along that. And then within that sarcomere, you've got something called your actin and your myosin micro myofilaments. Um, by the way, can I just get someone to put in the chat? Have you guys done muscle um, histology yet? No. Um, okay, so I'll go through this uh, maybe a little more slowly or hopefully. So if stuff doesn't make sense, do let me know. But also keep in mind because you'll probably be getting like a rehash of this. So don't stress too much. But also Crash Course does a really good job on this as well. So if it gets confusing, do go into that. Um, yeah, so these are just the different parts on your muscle um, or like skeletal muscle. One thing that you will have to know quite a bit is this section, what happens in a particular myofilament. Um, yep, yeah, is fascicle the same as muscle fiber? Yes, it is. Um, looks a bit different, but they're essentially interchangeable things. Um, so these are basically the different kind of fibers in your skeletal muscle. What holds them together? Your connective tissue. So we've got your epimyceum, perimyceum, and your endomyceum. So endo meaning the most inner, so endomyceum is going to come and surround your myofibrils. 
And then outside of that, we've got our perimysium surrounding the fascicles and bundles. And then outside of that, your epimysium, which is basically this whole entire dense connective layer on the outside. Um, okay, did not go next. All right, so this is basically where um, things can get a bit confusing, but faculty will also like press this quite a bit. So this, you really do have to know. So your sliding filament theory. Um, okay, so what happens is this is one myofibril. So one single thing inside your fascicles. What happens is your brain sends a signal to your muscle saying, I want to move somewhere. So then you guys haven't done this either, but okay. So signal will come along all the way down and then that's going to cause um, something called neurotransmitters to be released. So basically your brain gets a, uh, your muscle gets a signal from the brain saying, okay, we need to move. How does this actually happen? So action potential, that just means like your signal, it comes all the way down and synapses on your muscle cell. So synapse basically just means like it connects with your muscle cell. Um, and that signal will continue all the way down through these things called T tubules. And this activates a lot of calcium channels, which causes calcium to be released. Okay, so that's like part one of the story. Part two, if we go to this image. Yeah, part two. Okay, reorientate yourself. So this is going to be your actin. This is going to be your my myosin. So normally the purple thing, which is your actin, it's covered by these bodyguard things. So the line that you can see here, that's going to be your trypomyce, oh, trypomyosin. And then these little like bits and pieces, like the purple blob here, that's going to be your troponin. So normally your actin's covered by those two things. What happens though, when calcium comes along, that binds to your troponin and causes everything to kind of like shift. So then your troponin and your tropomyosin, they end up moving away from the actin. So then all of these like dark purple bits on here, these are going to be your actin binding sites. These are now exposed. So when they're exposed, then your myosin can then bind to your actin. So then what happens is, okay, so that's like part two of the story. Part three, um, <coughs> sorry, is what happens to your myosin. So normally your myosin's just there chilling and then an ATP will come along. So ATP, remember, gives you energy. So it binds to your my uh, myosin and then your myosin's like, oh, cool, this is energy. So it breaks down your ATP into your ADP and your phosphate. So that's written here as well. And this basically causes your myosin head to move to a cocked position. And in this cocked position, your myosin is now like ready to do something. So as we've kind of gone through previously, calcium has gone in, it's bound to your troponin and that causes your troponin and tropomyosin to move away from your actin. So revealing those actin binding sites. And now my, myosin has been bound to an ATP. It's broken it down to ADP and phosphate and it's cocked. So everything's like in motion. And then what happens is after it's like that, your myosin is going to bind to your actin and then that process pulls your actin and that's what causes your muscles to contract. And then afterwards, what happens is your ADP and phosphate, they unbind and a new ATP comes and binds to your myosin and then your myosin releases the actin and returns to its original position. And then it keeps on going over and over and over again. Um, so then, yeah, that breaks down to your ADP phosphate and then it's cocked, binds, release, ATP comes along, goes back, cocks, or like breaks it down, cocks it, and then continues. Um, yeah, so that's what will continually happen. And then ultimately it will get to a point where your brain is like, okay, I don't want to move anymore. So then that's going to stop that signal. And when it stops that signal, there's no longer going to be calcium release. When calcium is no longer released, your troponin and tropomyosin are going to fall back into place. And then your actin sites aren't going to be exposed anymore. So then your myosin can't bind. Um, yeah, hopefully that kind of makes sense. That was like a bit, yeah, a bit confusing, but this will constantly be brought up in your active learning sessions as well. So um, also if you're confused, there's also another link on the bottom as well. So that's the crash course. Um, yeah, okay, so this is a bit on histology, I guess. This is more just something that you have to learn um, as a picture. So the thing in the middle, oh, actually, I'll talk through this in there, okay. Um, so your A band, A band is overlap between actin and your myosin. So if we have a look, it's going to be this section. I band is only actin, so it's going to be this little bit here. H zone, only mice. Oh yeah, sorry, H zone, only myosin. So it's going to be this section. So the thick ones are your myosin, by the way, the thin ones are your actin. Um, Z line is essentially the boundaries between your sarcomeres. So 
this is going to be one sarcomere unit, this and another Z line here, that's going to be your next sarcomere unit. And M line is just midway between the two Z lines. Um, yeah, this is just stuff that you have to know. Okay, so almost finished in muscle, guys. Um, for muscle, types of muscle, you've got three different types. So first, skeletal, second, your cardiac, and third, your smooth. So skeletal, think we're moving stuff. Um, cardiac, your heart, and then smooth muscle, think like your stomach, like gastrointestinal tract. So for your skeletal muscle, we usually see them as like cylinders. Um, they've got striations. So this is characteristic of um, skeletal muscle. So first thing, they've got multiple nuclei along the periphery of the cell. They've got striations. So the striation just basically means like lines. Um, I have written it here. So muscle tissue marked by light and dark bands. Um, because skeletal muscle is used to do stuff, it's got a lot of mitochondria in it and it also a really good vascular supply. So vascular supply delivers oxygen. So if you're running and stuff, you're like using a lot of muscle, um, obviously you're going to need a lot of oxygen like delivered to those muscles. Um, so yep, we can separate those into two types of fibers. So your slow twitch fibers and your fast twitch fibers. Um, slow twitch fibers, think um, muscle that is being used, but kind of constantly, I guess. So think like your back muscles, I guess. So they're great. Um, they've got a greater resistance to fatigue. They're not going to fatigue um, too quickly. And um, still they're like, my, they need mitochondria because they're constantly going to be working. This is contrasted by your fast twitch fibers, which contain a lot of mitochondria and is used more for like peak running, I guess. So you've got your fast oxidative and your fast glycotic. Um, Yep, so oxidative, it's more like your mid-length like running, I guess like 800 meter runners. Glycolytic, it's more for like 100 meter sprinters. So this one has more um, rapid contraction, I guess, and stores glycogen. This one's more for anaerobic glycolysis. Um, you don't have to know too much about the difference. Um, I did a bit of a Google. It didn't tell me a lot. One like friend, she proposed that fast oxidative could be to do with like electron transport chain, which is why you produce more ATP, which is why like you can run further or something um, versus glycolytic, which is more just like glucose. But yeah, take that with a grain of salt. I don't think that's too accurate, but just know that for fast twitch fibers, you've got your fast oxidative, fast glycolytic versus your slow twitch fibers, which is just like um, something that can be constant. Okay, so that's your skeletal muscle. Now for cardiac muscle, one thing that you kind of have to know is it's got intercalated discs, which are these lines in between your cells, and also they're branched as well. So if you have a look at this one and follow it, it kind of starts off as one and branches off into two. And also it usually has one or two central nuclei. Um, so characteristics, cardiac muscle, it's got a lot of mitochondria because your heart has to constantly be pumping. And one another thing that you don't really need to know, but here for the sake of completion, um, T tubules and sarcoplasmic reticulum um, form something called dyads. I feel like what these are. So T tubules, um, they're basically like tubes where your the signal from your brain can travel down. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is just endoplasmic reticulum, but for your muscles. So these things can kind of come together and they form dyads. This is only important for the whole entire like sliding filament theory, which I was talking about before. But apart from that, it's not too important. Um, for your regenerative capacity, um, yeah, so limited regenerative capacity, think your heart, if you suffer from a heart attack, it's really hard for your heart to regenerate. So yeah, stay healthy. Um, last one, smooth muscle. Very different from the rest um, in the sense that this one's, um, it's got a very different shape. So elegant elongated spin shape. So it's like room, something like that. Also centrally located nucleus. It's got no striations, no T tubules, no sarcomeres, but it's still calcium dependent. So calcium influx is going to cause your smooth mass, smooth muscle to contract. Um, this, like I said, um, it's mostly present in your like GI tract, walls, arteries, veins, etc. cetera. Um, and under autonomous control, meaning you don't think about it. So you don't think, oh, I want to churn my food in my stomach. Yeah, your body just does that automatically. And this is a table summarizing all of that. So for skeletal muscle, it looks something like this. It's going to have multiple nuclei on the periphery. It's going to be long, cylindrical, and have striations. We can control it so it's voluntary and it moves everything. Well, majority of the stuff moves the body, essentially. Cardiac muscle, it's something like this. It's branched, usually has a single central nuclei with intercalated discs. It's going to be involuntary and also contract your heart um, to pump blood around the body. Smooth muscle, um, it's going to be spindle-shaped with a single and central nuclei. 
it's involuntary um, and it basically compresses your organs and moves food throughout your gastrointestinal tract. Um, okay, might quickly ask, have you guys, oh wait, sorry, just going through a couple of questions. Um, what's a tea tubule? Okay, I kind of mentioned that a little bit. Um, but if we go all the way back here, so all of the red stuff, that's going to be your tea tubules. And you'll learn this a little bit later on, but the importance of that is if we just have the signal, so normally the way, uh, sorry, it's okay. Um, normally the way that signal comes to your muscle, it's done by something called neurotransmitters. So your brain basically it signals and it goes through like a bunch of neurons. And at the end of your neuron, it releases something called neurotransmitters. And this basically jumps from one neuron to the next neuron. And then when it attaches to the receptors, it basically starts to signal all over again. Um, the importance of T-tubules is if I kind of just follow this blue thing from the brain all the way to your muscle cell, your signal is only going to reach like the outside um, bits of your cell. So T-tubules, it helps your signal continue all the way down to reach all of your myofibrils and therefore like, oh, so to reach all of like the individual sarcomere stuff, um, which basically helps potentiate your action potential. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Um, yeah, so going back to the question, just in general, would you guys prefer for me to go through connective tissue or leave it until you guys actually have done that? So maybe till like next week. Go through it now. Yeah, okay, that's fine as well. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's try and go through this. So connective tissue. Um, so we've talked about muscles and we've also talked about epithelium. So connective tissue is like everything in between, I guess. Um, that's not bone. Bone is like separate. So connective tissue forms the framework for the extracellular um, environment. So it's located throughout the whole entire body except for your central nervous system, which is just going to be nerves. So what it does, it supports stuff. It gives you like additional strength. Um, also exchange of metabolites, we'll talk about that in a bit later. So think your connective tissue is like your tendons, your ligaments, the things that are supporting your body. Um, yeah, so these are the different components of connective tissue. So connective tissue, it's made up of your specialized cells and your extracellular matrix. Inside your extracellular matrix, it's got your ground substance, which is like everything except for your fibers. And what are your fibers? We divide those into three. So you've got your collagen, your elastin, and your reticula. So we'll go into a bit more depth into each one of these um, now. So specialized cells, they come from something called your mesenchymal cells. Um, if you think back to like stem cells, just know like mesenchymal cells, they're like, they're pluripotent, meaning they can differentiate into different types of cells. So they can form chondroblasts, which form your cartilage, lipoblasts, lipoblasts, lipo meaning like, thinking like fat, so adipocytes. Fibroblasts, so it forms like fibrous stuff, including like your ligaments, tendons, etc. Your osteoblasts, osteo is like bone, so it forms bone. Myoblasts, myo for like muscle, so then skeletal muscle. Um, so that's your specialized cells, which can form different kinds of other cells later on. So extracellular matrix, so that was like the second whole entire section. So it's made up of two main bits, your ground substance versus your fibers, right? Um, so fibers, we have three different types. So First type, we've got collagen. This is the one that you will hear a lot about. So like, oh, buy this product. It like helps collagen, which helps your skin or something. That's like what collagen is used for. Um, it's also what's used to make up your tendons and your ligaments. So as a result, it's going to be extremely strong, high tensile strength, and it provides like strength and structural integrity. Um, elastin, think like elastic stuff. So extremely like bouncy. So think stuff in your arteries, your skin, ear, and alveolar life. So if you think like your ear, it's going to be like, it's not as hard to like push down your ear as it is like with the muscle or something. Um, third type, reticular, um, it's made up of a type three collagen and it basically just looks like a mesh. This is probably like the least important out of all of them. And your fourth one, um, this isn't a fiber. This is just like the other thing. So ground substance, ground substance is everything in between. So um, if you have a look at the schematic, all of the little purple bits, these are your specialized cells. All of the red bits, these are your fibers. And then everything in between, so like the whole entire backdrop is your ground substance. So ground substance is like gel that everything else is suspended in. And it provides your nutrient supply and also mechanical support. So histology, this is like an actual image of what it looks like. This is just like a diagram. Oops. 
Okay, yeah. So what are the different types of extracellular matrix? So depends on what's there. That's how we classify it. So if it's a fluid-like thing, oh, sorry, if it's blood, like fluid-like um, fibrous, think like fibrous connected tissue, a lot of fibers inside. If it's gel-like, it's like a cartilage thing and solid, think bone because like bone is solid. Um, okay, so this is like proper classification. How do we classify the different types of connective tissue? So we've got our loose connective tissue, which won't contain a lot of fibers. We've got a dense connective tissue, which will contain a lot of fibers because it's like densely packed and regular, irregular. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then you've got your specialized, that's, I did not spell that correctly. Oh no, but it's an image. Okay, um, I may or may not fix that because fixing that will require me to redo this. We'll see. Um, so specialized connective tissue, it's going to contain your cartilage and your bone. So cartilage, different types. Oh, here, bone, we've got two different types as well. So going into your loose connective tissue. So as I said, not a lot of fibers in there. And as a result, it's going to be flexible and deformable. So think things such as your fat and also areola tissue. Um, so breast tissue, um, a lot of open space between those and also reticular, just like a mesh. Dense connective tissue, meanwhile, will have a lot of fibers, and then we can split those up into two. So you've got a dense regular versus your dense irregular. So dense regular, it's going to be aligned in parallel orientations. So if you think about, um, I don't know, your biceps or something. So if, yeah, you're going to get the most strength by picking stuff up like in this direction versus like sideways or something that won't work as well. So for regular stuff, it's going to be parallel and regular orientations. In contrast, it's going to be your dense irregular, which is just random orientations. Um, these are going to be present in like your skin, your artery walls. So if you have a look at your skin versus like um, your arm muscles or like leg muscles, I guess. So skin, if you kind of like push and pull it, it goes in like different directions. Um, it's not like particularly strong in one direction versus if let's say you're picking something up, it's going to be a lot stronger if you pick it up in one certain way versus like a really weird convoluted different direction. So yeah, that's your dense connective tissue. Um, cartilage, one thing to kind of remember and know from it, um, it's avascular, aneural and alymphatic. Um, one thing that, yeah, I don't know because I never got a cartilage piercing, but apparently if you do, you don't get a lot of blood. You still do because you're going through like skin, but yeah, you're not going to get a lot of blood. Um, and if you have a look at like these three characteristics, as a result, if it's avascular, um, because a lot of nutrients is carried through the blood, if you do damage your cartilage, it's really hard for it to repair. And the main reason for that is because you don't have that blood supply. Um, and you and lymphatic, kind of like additional points, I guess. Um, yep, so they're produced by chondrocytes and they're strong, flexible, and they resist compression as well. That's just because they have quite a bit of like water inside of it. Um, I'm losing my voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, yep, and also, yeah, limited repair capacity. So there's three main types of cartilage that you have to know. So first, hyaline cartilage, second, elastic fibro cartilage, and third, fibro cartilage. So if we go into that, hyaline cartilage, you can think of them as like little glass bulbs. So these are extremely strong and flexible and they resist compression. Um, Yep, so they're responsible for the elongation of bones. So you guys haven't done this either, but essentially when you're a kid, um, your long bones in your leg, they, okay, if you take an X-ray of a kid versus like an adult, you'll find that the bones don't actually like meet together. They're like separated by like quite a bit of space. And that whole entire section is mostly cartilage. And it's only as you grow older and your cartilage like finishes growing, growing, your cartilage becomes bone. Um, but yeah, just know that your hyaline cartilage is what makes up most of those things. Um, also, if you damage your hyaline cartilage, it's not going to come back. Um, it's basically replaced by something called fibrous cartilage, and this is your scar tissue because a lot of fiber in it. Um, and those two things, they've got different functional capacities as well. So hyaline cartilage, like I said, you'll see like most um, you'll see more of them in comparison to other ones because they're most abundant. Um, and this is just like another diagram of that. So elastic fiber cartilage, these are the ones with more elastin fibers in there. So they're going to be more like flexible. Um, they're present only in your head and neck. So if you think your external ER, if you try like pressing in your ER, we'll find that it can compress. I really hope it can compress. Um, yep, yeah, so these are more mesh-like. And if you have a look, it'll look something like that. Um, yep, yeah, so they're surrounded by collagen and elastin. 
third one, fibro cartilage. It's like the love child of hyaline cartilage versus your dense connective tissue. So characteristics of both. We've got hyaline cartilage, which like if we go back here, you'll find that it's extremely strong and flexible and dense connective tissue. That's just got a lot of collagen fibers essentially. So it's a dense network of collagen fibers. And as a result, it's going to be extremely strong and also resistant to compression. Um, yeah, these are basically where you'll find them. So a nervous fibrosis, it's something that's in your intervertebral disc. So um, IV disc is just like the different, the things that are present between different bones in your back. And meniscus, if you have a look at your knee, um, your knee joint, it's kind of like the cartilage that's like slotted in there as well. Um, you'll learn more about it later on. So we're going to too much depth. But that's that. Now we've gone through that. We might as well go through bone. <laughs> There's like only like 10 more slides or something. Um, so for bone, like we mentioned previously at the start of like the connective tissue, sorry. So, oh no, not this slide. Yeah, for bone, we've got compact bone and we've got trabecular bone. So what is the difference? Um, so just in, <clears throat> just in general, so bone, you're made, it's made of osteocytes in the extracellular matrix and it's got a very rich neurovascular supply. <clears throat> so meaning if you do fracture a bone or something, you'll find that it does grow back quite a bit. Like it will grow back versus like damaging your heart tissue or something. Um, yeah, so two types of bone, compact versus trabecular. Uh, if you kind of have a look here, compact is this. Trabecular is the honeycomb-like appearance. So um, compact bone, it's dense, it's solid, and it's arranged into things that look like these tree trunks. So if we have a look at that, so there's something called a central canal, that's whatever's running in the middle, and this is where you'll have like a lot of um, vessels, veins, and nerves. And these rings outside, these are called your lamellae. They have things called osteocytes embedded inside of them. Um, and each one of these like massive rings, or like one like tree trunk, I guess you could think of it, is called an osteon. Um, and this is basically just an image having all of these individual parts in there. So I'll let you guys have a look at it in your own time. This is like another image that you can have a look as well. Versus trabecular bone, this is more like a honeycomb kind of appearance thing. And bone regeneration, you don't have to know too much about this either, but basically if you fracture your bone, it's going to cause inflammation, causing like a lot of blood to be um, sent to that area because nutrients and then that's going to cause your bone to remodel and then ultimately heal. Um, okay, long bones. So we can split that into three main parts. So you've got your epiphysis, which is, oh sorry, epiphysis I think is how it's pronounced. It's basically the end of your bone. Um, diaphysis is the region in the middle and in the middle you've got something called your medullary cavity, which is this section here and that's basically where your bone marrow is stored. And then you've got your metaphysis, which is the section in between. So metaphysis is the interesting section because it contains that hyaline cartilage that we talked about before. So as you grow, your metaphysis, um, so when you're very young, sorry, this has actually got cartilage in between. And as you age, that is going to turn to bone. That's what we call endochondral ossification. And by the time you're like 18 to 21 and you stop growing, then you're going to get um, a line in there. So if you can kind of have a look, it's like, this line here that's called your epiphyseal line and basically just like marks where like your cartilage was growing before but now it's like stopped yep so that's your lung bone um different layers inside of them we're almost done three more slides guys um periosteum so that's your outermost layer it's going to be extremely tough and then it's got two layers there so your outer fibrous layer and inner fibrous layer you can kind of just see that that's like one there one there yep and then inside of that you've got your dense compact bone um yeah also in the image and then endosteum and then your spongy tissue inside this is also like something that you just have to learn um your spongy tissue it will contain your red and yellow bone marrow and that's something that's a bit interesting so red bone marrow that basically contain, contains a lot of your hemopoietic stem cells so heme think blood poetic stem cells just like producing a lot of different cells so these are going to produce your blood cells so red blood cells white blood cells and other immune cells as well um, you're going to find them mostly in your long bones. Yellow bone marrow, it mostly produces your mesenchymal stem cells. So if we think all the way back to like the start of um, connective tissue, all of like the cells, mesenchymal stem cells that produce your different specialized cells, that's what these are. Um, so these are going to produce your cartilage, your bone, muscle and fat. And just a few fun facts. Um, so as you age, your red bone marrow slowly converts to yellow bone marrow. And However, it is a reversible process. So if you lose a lot of blood, 
your yellow bone marrow can actually go back to become your red bone marrow to make up for the loss. Because remember, red bone marrow it produces all your red blood cells, which is um, basically what makes up your blood. Yep, and these are just some other kind of bone cells. <laughs> you won't really be tested on this either. But yeah, osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. So progenitor cells think gener genitor is like generating. So you basically grow bone. So it's osteoprogenitor cells grow the bone. Osteoblasts, um, this was basically in one of the previous slides as well. So this is going to synthesize like the organic components in the extracellular matrix. Osteocytes, these are the things that were embedded in your lamellae inside the osteons, so inside the actual bone. And then osteoclasts, this is used to remodel and um, like repair bones. So let's say something's gone wrong, so it will erode away like certain bone and then remodel it and then allow it to like continue growing. Whew, okay, and that, whoops, is the end of um, all of your primary tissue types. So thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll be sticking around for like, I don't know, a couple of minutes afterwards if you guys have any more questions. Um, but after, yeah, apart from that, we'll give you the link to this recording and also all the slides should be inside the Google Drive anyway. But yeah, otherwise, thank you for tuning in.